Okay, I think we should. Uh, I think we should get started. Uh, so yeah, once again, thanks everyone for joining us this morning for this webinar on the Matrice 300 RTK from DJI. Uh, my name's Sam Deniff. I am the UAV strategist for public safety and defence with uh, with Copters. Um, joining me today as our special guest is Eduardo Rodriguez, who is DJI's uh, enterprise product manager. If you want to say say hello, Eduardo. Yeah, absolutely. So good morning, everyone. Hope you can you can also hear me well. And uh, thanks, Sam, and thanks uh, Copters team for inviting me uh, here today. Um, really happy to to be talking to you guys about the one of the main projects that we've been working on the, on the DJI Enterprise Department for the past year. Fantastic. Okay, and uh, hopefully everyone can hear uh, Eduardo. Okay, but I know the audio is coming through through great for me. Uh, firstly, a little bit of uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, obviously, you've got the chat function on the side there to you know say hello and keep in touch. But in terms of questions, there is just below the slides. If you scroll down, a like a questions box. So as you think of stuff you want to ask for the Q and A at the end, if you can post them into that questions box rather than into the chat, just because if stuff goes into the chat, we can miss it because lots goes in there and it's easy for it to get sort of sort of buried. Um, so post your questions into the questions. We probably won't answer them as we go, but we'll save them all up. And if we haven't covered them in the presentation, we'll have a nice big Q and A uh, towards the end and answer all those questions. Okay, so firstly, uh, briefly, uh, I'll give you a little bit about us and about me. So as I said, my name's Sam Deniff, UAV strategist for Copters. Uh, worked in the drone industry now for just over four years uh, and obviously worked for Copters, who began as Martech Marine in 1999, who were marine engineering specialists. So for those of you that don't know, Copters formed in 2016. Uh, we look to revolutionize organizations using drones. So we supply the drone equipment, uh, we supply the training, uh, the software, the support, the consultancy, and the aim is to make businesses safer, faster, more efficient, save money, save time, uh, save lives in some areas as well. Um, so we supply equipment from all the lead drone, leading drone manufacturers, um, including obviously DJI, um, along with a range of other best in class manufacturers. Uh, we now work with um, a huge, huge amount of UK emergency services, all areas of the UK military, uh, a wide range of more industrial applications um, with utilities companies, inspection companies, survey companies, construction. Um, so really right across the board. Uh, and this new launch fits in really well with our our main clients uh, in those areas. Um, Eduardo, I don't know if you want to give a bit more of an in-depth um, sort of introduction or if you're happy with, with what you've done so far. Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, we'll carry on on to sort of what we're going to look at discussing uh, today. Um, so we've got a few, we've got a few quotes here from some of the guys we've previously worked with. Um, so it's not just obviously not just the equipment, but the training side as well. And um, we've got Geo Access there, uh, Networks Three, and Oil Field Testing Services. Um, so yeah, by all means, take a look through these, and uh, we've got a few more from uh, the public safety side of things as well. Um, here we go. So a few of the police forces that we've worked for and fire services as well, in terms of supplying equipment and and training. So this is what we're going to look to cover today. Um, we want to give as much time as possible to the Q and A. Um, what I'm aware of is that there's been uh, some webinars done by DJI. There's been some webinars done by us um, that have gone really in depth into the features of the drone, what they do and, and what they're for. Um, we are going to look at spotlighting some of the key features that I've picked out as um, arguably the more important ones and what's in it for me or for my business in terms of those features as well. Um, we're then going to sort of discuss how these will change the game, focusing primarily on the inspection and drone services side of things, and also looking at um, looking at public safety uh, as, as my main area as well. Um, but I imagine for most of you, the more relevant side will be what the drone can do in terms of sort of inspection and construction side of businesses. Um, we'll look at how it can benefit your business, uh, what it will do for an existing drone business to uh, to really increase the scope of the work that can be done. Uh, and then also 
if you're looking at starting a drone business, potentially why this might fit in well to, to do that. Uh, and then obviously we'll look at how copters can help you. So we'll look at stuff like um, uh, the purchasing routes, the continued support we can give, the training, the software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, finally, obviously, will be the Q&A. Uh, as I said, the plan is to give as much time to the Q&A as possible. So as we go through, please post your questions and myself and Eduardo will, uh, will answer uh, as many, hopefully all of those uh, in the time we've got. Okay, so firstly, what is the Matrice 300 RTK? As I said, there's been uh, various webinars and various launches already in terms of what the drone is and what it can do. To give you a brief overview, it's DJI's latest commercial drone platform. So um, not replacing, but a predecessor, well, a continuation of the Matrice 200 series, um, building on some of the, the features of that that were more popular and upgrading areas that needed upgrading uh, to give you uh, a more capable, more versatile platform. Um, there's huge upgrades in terms of safety and security features, which we'll look at uh, and why they're important. Um, and it's been paired with these, these new payloads, the H20 series. Um, so those, again, we're going to look at a bit more depth. As we know, drones are just another tool to sort of get sensors into areas maybe you couldn't access because they were hard to access or expensive to access. So you had to use a helicopter, uh, whatever it may be, or unsafe to access. So the sensors are the, the real stars of the show. Um, so that's something we're going to focus on as well. Um, all in all, it's we definitely say it's revolutionary. It's a big jump forwards in terms of the technology. There's the, the huge jump in flight time range, um, potentially going to set new industry standards. Um, and there's also some of the more advanced AI features um, that give you access to new applications that potentially you couldn't access previously. Um, so we'll take a look at all that in more depth. I hope that's given you, a, if you didn't already know, a brief overview of, of what the drone is and what it can do. Um, so just highlighting some of the features then that, that we see as being the most important uh, currently, currently out there. Um, First is looking at the transmission range. So it has the capability, the new OcuSync Enterprise, to give a 15 kilometer range. Now, obviously, um, you're not going to use that day to day. Um, I think, Eduardo, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, uh, you mentioned that it's also that's not available to be used like in that fashion in the UK anyway. That's the US version yeah. of the system. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the 15 kilometers is just under FCC conditions. Uh, here in Europe, for the CE environment, it's uh, up to eight kilometers in ideal, in ideal conditions. Yeah, yeah. So I think the way, to, the way to look at this is, firstly, it shows you, because organizations are already exploring extended visual line of sight and beyond visual line of sight, you know, certain missions are already requiring pushing the current technology to its limits. So not so much the fact that you're ever going to use this, but the capability is is there within the system. It's kind of like how you know you're not going to use the uh, you're not going to drive at 150 miles an hour in your car down the down the motorway, but it can be nice to know that it can it can get up to speed quicker uh, and handle higher speeds quicker. It's kind of similar a kind of similar feature to that. Um, also, they're mentioning the the AES 256 encryption. Uh, and also the fact that there's more reliability in, in high interference areas. So the encryption side of things is becoming more and more important. People are becoming more uh, security uh, and sort of hacking conscious. Um, in your day-to-day -day job as a drone service provider, that might not be an issue, but it's something clients could well ask for. Uh, you know, what kind, of, what kind of encryption do you have on your system? Um, and now you can say you've got a level that's, uh, you know, pretty, pretty much to an industry standard. Okay, just moving on to the so on to the flight time. Um, this obviously is the kind of the easiest to see where the where the benefits are. You're looking at a, a 55 minute flight time in the, in total. Uh, so that'd be without any payloads. Obviously, in most cases, you will be flying with with payloads. Um, so with the H20T camera, which we'll come on to, you've got a 43 minute flight time. So if you've got uh, four sets of batteries. You're looking at almost um, what's that? Three, almost three hours of flight time in uh, in total from those sets before they need to be charged. Um, 
obviously there's massive benefits to pretty much any commercial drone operations that you're going to do at all um if you pair this flight time with the hot swappable batteries which is basically the feature where you can take out one of the two and replace it with a new battery and vice versa so the drone doesn't have to be turned off when the batteries are switched you can have the sustained long uh, operations with minimal interruption and again with the new battery station where you can put eight batteries in at once there's there's very little chance of any sort of disruption or slowing down of, of any drone operation um what i would say is even also with the maximum takeoff weight of nine kilos you're still getting a 30 minute just over 30 minute flight time um and then as well in terms of these features you've got the wind resistance has been upped so you've gone up to 15 meters a second which is about 33 and a half miles per hour uh, and the top speed's been increased as well to what works out about 51 just over 51 miles per hour um, as well so another jump up in terms of the uh, the conditions this drone can operate in which obviously as we know for the uk market very very important and we'll see how that pairs up with some of the other sort of safety um, and ingress features that have been added in um, to give you something that's going to be able to fly in you know, across the across the board throughout the year and not have to worry about the sort of weather issues you might be having So the AI and the, and the smart features that have been included. Firstly, you've got the sort of smart inspection feature, so the spot check. Um, effectively, this allows for automation of inspection missions. So your your camera, which would have to be, I believe that has to be the H20 series, um, would effectively recognise points of interest. Uh, and save them within the drones within the drones brain so you can return to those immediately um sort of on repeat operations so say i think that the example they're giving in the in the in the image you can see is a power line say there's certain areas of that power line that need to be inspected once a week once a month once every three months whatever it may be you can set the same points to be inspected by the by the drone um so it's just another way of saving time and saving money um for some someone who's looking to either work for or work with um, utilities and power-based companies, um, this is going to make that job a, a lot easier to automate. Um, in terms of the looking at inspecting larger areas, whether that's to locate, I don't know, locate a missing person um, or locate a vehicle and follow it, you've got the ability to tag a location um, to give data to ground teams. Um, so rather than just saying there's someone or something over there we need to look at whether again that's a, a safety feature like um, looking for a person or a vehicle or whether that's just identifying uh, a bit of damaged i don't know pipe work or whatever it may be uh, you can give the exact exact coordinates of that location uh it kind of kind of bleeds into the pinpoint and the smart track features as well uh, which can be shared through um software like flight hub and also to another remote controller um, so again, it's just it's it's allowing for data to be sent between teams easier. So the, the takeaway from this is that your drone operator is no longer just a guy flying a drone that's separate from everyone else. They can link into the traditional methods better, more effectively. Um, again, it's it's all within the inspection world. It's saving time and saving money, and obviously the safety aspect of not having to send uh, man teams in to do inspections at heights as well. Um, just worth mentioning there as well, the uh, primary flight display and the nav display as well. Um, so giving you all that wind speed, altitude, location, uh, obstacle mapping data, it just means you can concentrate on, on flying the drone effectively is what we found. So um, you can concentrate on what the payloads are capturing, which is the important, important thing in any operation. Increase the quality of the work you're outputting as a result of that. And also obviously be sort of more aware of your surroundings as well um i guess you could say it is a it is a safety feature because it's allowing you to concentrate more on what you're doing but it's going to benefit the business massively in terms of uh, in terms of sort of making your operations a bit more streamlined and then onto the onto the safety upgrades so this i think for for me anyway is is sort of the biggest jump forwards from some of the stuff that DJI have done here. Um, so the IP45 rating, um, for those that don't know, the IP45, the first number is the 
um, ingress of like solid materials, so dust and whatever else it may be. The second number is probably the more important one, which is the, the water ingress, so water protection. Um, now, there have been drones in the past that have claimed to be up to IP, say, 5.4 or 5.5. Um, but the testing with this has proved that it is well and truly up to those up to those measures. So what this means is that water projected against um, the drone from any direction won't have any harmful effects. So that means that you'd have to worry about moisture getting up into the underside of the drone. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's whether it's rain or spray or whatever it may be. Um, it's going to be completely covered. Um, if you if you pair that with the fact that also you've got the ESCs are in the body of the drone. Um, it just means the drone can be flown in even harsher conditions without worrying about failures. So I think we see this opening up maybe more offshore applications as well and just flying in harsher conditions. Um, if you pair this with the fact that you've got multiple layers of redundancy in, for example, the batteries uh, and the GPS, um, and also obviously the props as well, the three propeller emergency landing system, um, you've just got a system that's going to be more adaptable when it comes to things like regulation changes. Um, so, you know, you don't have to worry too much about as the regulations change, this has got so many safety features, you're going to be able to fly in those, um, you know, more congested and, uh, and tricky to fly in areas. And obviously working in more safety conscious industries. Um, so without the features that, that this gives you, certain uh, organizations might not let you onto their, onto their land near their buildings to, to operate. Um, so a lot of these things are going to become the industry standard as we move forward, um, especially stuff like having the ADSB feature included on the drone and having that really advanced anti-collision system as well. Um, just to just to go into the so the three propeller emergency landing system a bit more, just to give you some some detail on that. So when a um, one of the uh, if one of the props fails effectively for any reason, uh, the other three will allow the drone to land. Not to say you can carry on flying by any stretch, but rather than the drone drop to the ground, it will it will bring itself down. Um, and the theory being that it will save your your cameras, your sensors, and save the drone from damage uh, as well. We've seen it in practice, and it does work. Um, so the old pushback of I need to buy a drone or use a drone that has six props or eight props isn't really as relevant anymore. So this is going to change the way we think about what kind of drones we uh, we operate. Um, so moving on to the moving on to the cameras, the camera systems now. Uh, so the H20 series is the new cameras that have been launched with the Matrice 300 RTK. Um, so what you've got here is the specs of the camera up on your screen there. As a brief overview, this is basically like the Z30 on steroids, and then you've got a wide angle camera, and then you've got a thermal camera, and then you've got a laser rangefinder all in one sensor. So you can have one camera on the drone and hits all major needs in just that one that one sensor. So you could pair this with something like a spotlight or a secondary camera. It just leaves slots open for development and it's going to improve the versatility of, uh, of your business or your drone team or whatever it may be. Um, so just meaning you can, you can either top mount this and have a two cameras underneath. You can have this as one of your options and a further two cameras, uh, one on bottom, one on top. So three sensors in total, but one of those sensors actually has four, <laughs> four sensors built into it. So the amount of data you can gather with this as one system is way more than anything we've seen previously. Um, and it is still compatible with some of the, the old DJI cameras. So the uh, Zemuse X-T2, the thermal camera with the dual, the dual visual, and the, uh, the Z30 option as well. Um, I think we've got some more specs on this on the next slide. Um, so yeah, in terms of the in terms of the zoom application for the uh, for the visual camera, you've got uh, twenty three times optical zoom, which obviously isn't as much as the Z thirty, which was thirty times zoom. However, what you'll find is that the uh, image quality is so good because it's a twenty megapixel camera that you can zoom in further it's up to two hundred times maximum zoom. Um, it just means you can you can if we're looking at inspection wise you can inspect a target from a massive distance um, and get really high quality imagery um, without having to go near to any structures or buildings that perhaps you don't want to go near to. Um, the fact that you can then switch between that and radiometric thermal camera 
um, and also switch onto the laser rangefinder and get accuracy in terms of how far away your target is. Um, all the data that you can either give to clients or feedback directly uh, is just gonna be more and more accurate. Uh, Eduardo, I don't see anything you want to touch on there on the uh, on the camera side of things on the Hope 20 series? Well, nope, not at all. I mean, just playing it greatly. So yeah, <laughs> all the features are pretty much the ones that you said. Um, just something that I would like to highlight really briefly is uh, with the H20 series, it's not just about the tech specs that you can get from the different sensors, from the different cameras. It's also about, and probably even more important, is about the intelligence behind. So it's about what the camera can do with all the data that those sensors are actually capturing. And that's pretty much related to uh, what you mentioned in a few slides uh, earlier. Uh, it's all about artificial intelligence. It's all about augmented reality. It's all about gathering high quality data um, to make sure that uh, any type of requirement can be met. Yeah, that's a, that's a massive part of it. It's, it's, it's all these features that we can highlight all day long. It's the way they the way they blend together. So some of them you might say, oh, well, you know, well, so what? The Matrice 200 had this feature. So what? The Mavic Jewel has, has this feature. Um, it's more the fact that when they fit together, yeah, a perfect example, stuff like the what the H20, T can do with some of the the spot check inspection AI. Um, that's what makes it a, a completely different beast. And it is the versatility that, that helps. Um, I would say as well, I don't think I mentioned this is IP44 rated. Um, so not quite as high rated as the drone itself, but still obviously capable of flying in, in some poor conditions. Um, it just means that it can't take water from any angle. But obviously, bear in mind, in most cases, this will be mounted underneath your drone. So it's still protected from um, rain and moisture by its IP44. Um, and that'd be more than enough for, for where it's located. Um, so just moving on then to uh, some of the stuff that, that we do as copters in terms of the way we've packaged this and the way we're looking to, to, to sort of fit it into the industry. Um, there's two setups that we've put together that fit with most applications to get the most out of the drone. So if you're looking at going um, effectively all out, the H20T is the obvious op option in terms of the in terms of the camera. Um, it's a no brainer if you're looking at pretty much anything to do with inspection uh, and anything to do with search and rescue or public safety applications. Um, with this as well, we've put in a, a secondary controller, a slave controller. Um, and also the upward gimbal connector, the uh, enough batteries to fill the battery charger case that comes with it as standard, and our premium care package as well. But what we've also done is included um, all the necessary training to start operating with it. Um, so you've got the, the PFCO courses uh, and the chief pilots, the off-call five course as well. Uh, and we're also doing specialist handover training and operations manual reviews as well. Um, so obviously, people who are looking at purchasing the Matrice 300, I imagine most of them will already be operating drones in some way, so probably have the PFCO. Um, what I would say is these don't have to be used by you, and they don't have to be used by you immediately. So if you are a loan operator that's looking to expand, keep these on, on credit as training credits and apply them to members of your team in the future. Or obviously, if you've already got members of your team that aren't fully trained up, you can apply these credits to, to them as well. Uh, and then the handover training, obviously at the moment it's tricky to carry out anything uh, person to person in terms of training. Um, what we'll do in the short term is a virtual handover with the goal obviously of doing the physical handover as soon as we possibly can, which we're hoping will be very soon. Um, the handover is not so much to just teach you how to fly and show you what drones can do. Because of all the safety features this has, the collision avoidance and all that stuff, it's relatively easy to fly, very easy to operate. It's more just because there's so many features that it has that if you don't have someone to show you through them, you could operate it for a year and still not get all the capability out of the drone. So that's why getting a handover is, is really important as part of this. Um, we've got another, another package as well, which is sort of more of an entry level package. So you've still got the drone itself, obviously, and all the accessories and spares. You've got a few less batteries and the H20 camera. So when we looked at the image of the H20T, the H20, as the name suggests, is the same camera, just without the thermal the thermal aspect. 
So you've still got the 23 times zoom with a 20 megapixel uh, camera. You've got the wide angle lens camera as well, and you've got the laser rangefinder. Uh, the same training package is included. Uh, there's one less PFCO course place, uh, but you've still got the handover training. You've still got the chief pilots course as well. So all the training you'd need uh, to get up and running. Um, so the great thing with with looking at something like this is the I'd say the adaptability. So if the budget isn't there immediately to go for this full ultimate package and really get yourself into the you know get yourself into the top end in terms of what this can do, you can start with the drone itself and with one of the slightly lower priced um, payloads because of the way the drone is designed as new payloads are released. And as you can move up to stuff like the H20T and the top end payloads, you can simply bolt those on uh, and jump straight into using them. Um, so you can get started at the lower level in terms of budget and build up to these larger systems that are more capable as time goes by. And I think DJI probably had that in mind when they priced the system and the cameras as well. Um, so it fits in well. I think you'll be surprised if you do get in touch in terms of what the costs are, but it fits in well with starting off with the drone system um, and then being able to upgrade as you as you progress your business. Uh, so in terms of uh, the support that we do at, uh, at Copters as well, um, we are a DJI approved uh, repair center. Uh, we're a fully accredited drone training provider. So we're what's currently known as an NQE, which is gonna change to an RAE as the regulations change in, uh, in November. Um, so we do all the full PFCO training. We'll do the A2C of C or the GBC training as that rolls out as well and conversion courses between the two. If you are concerned about regulations before purchasing a drone, setting up a business, any of that kind of stuff, um, let us know. We can walk you through uh, sort of uh, why it's not quite as complicated as it sounds. It's, it's tricky to explain uh, sort of in, in text, but a, a quick phone call, we can we can quite easily explain to you sort of the best, the best route to go down in terms of the regulations. Um, we'll of course do handovers with our expert uh, instructors. Um, you will get with something of this level, the enterprise drones, an extended warranty. So uh, the manufacturer, DJI, give a 20, uh, 12 month warranty. We'll uh, up that to, to 24 in total. Uh, you've got ongoing tech support from our tech team and also servicing and repairs. So you'll get the drone serviced effectively like an MOT every six months as part of these packages uh, as well. In terms of pre-orders uh, and stock availability and pricing and all that kind of stuff, which I'm sure we've got plenty of, sure we've got plenty of questions on. Um, so the first units are available from today. <laughs> what I would say is all those first units are already spoken for, so pre-ordered. So they are sort of coming in and going straight back out to customers. Um, so we're still, normally we'd stop taking pre-orders once we get stock, but because these are going out so quickly, um, we're still taking pre-orders now. So it's a thousand pounds plus VAT, 1200 pounds, which you can do via the website. Um, and you can pre-order a system or you can pre-order one of the packages with the cameras, which is 10% of the, whatever the package cost is. Um, the lead time is, is relatively short for the equipment at the moment. So we're looking at sort of two to three weeks from the point of your order to be able to have the, the stock in, which is great. And it's great to see that DJI haven't been adversely affected by, uh, by what's been happening recently and are getting the stock out to us nice and quickly. Um, and also we do business financing options. Uh, we do business leasing options uh, as well. Uh, and also obviously personal finance. Um, so if it is something you're interested in, Drop me an email to the below. Uh, let us know in the in the questions or whatever, so I can pick it up and, and give you a call and chat through the options. And um, and uh, yeah, we'll see what we can do in terms of the in terms of the pricing. Um, obviously, stuff like this being enterprise level kit, it's price and application, so we can't just go here with the prices. What I would say is um, you'd be pleasantly surprised at the cost of the equipment and the packages. Um, for those of you that do know, think similar to the Matrice Two Hundred series. Uh, you know, it's not a massive jump up um, and stuff like the H20T, again, think similar and actually less than the than the X-T2 range of cameras. So although you've got that capability of the a lot of the features of the X-T2 and then the Z30 and all the other features the camera has, your cost isn't jumping up. It's still in that ballpark of, of similar to the standard thermal cameras. Um, 
So again, if you're interested and want to know more on the costs and what you're interested in, drop me an email, give us a call, and uh, yeah, we'll uh, see how we can help you out. Okay, so I've I've rambled on there for about half an hour, so we'll jump into the. I was hoping to get done a little bit quicker, but we'll uh, we'll jump into the Q and A. Um, so we'll run through them. I'll pull Eduardo in for the ones that uh, may be more relevant for for him from DJI, uh, and see if we can get through all these questions. Okay. Um, so first one uh, from. So Ben Fickering, um, how much support will DJI give for developing research payloads, communicating through the ports using the antenna to transmit data to the ground, specifically wanting to connect meteorological sensors, but don't want to add unnecessary comms kit? I, I guess that's probably more one for you, Eduardo. <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. So um, what I can say uh, with regards to this question is that the Payload SDK, so the Payload Software Develop Development Kit that we have uh, available for um, third-party manufacturers or uh, third-party developers, it's already including these type of features where um, all the different components of the drone are connected between each other and the data the data of those different components can be sent back to the ground. Um, it doesn't really matter the type of sensor you connect through payload SDK. Uh, as long as there is a proper integration between the payload and the drone, this data will be uh, sent back to the to the remote controller. But again, it need, it's important to, to make sure that the integration, the software integration is properly performed. So in terms of support from DJI, the payload SDK, as I mentioned, there is also support from our uh, developers to work with these third-party developers uh, to make sure that the, the the development and the integration is properly done. But there is nothing uh, in terms of meteorological meteorological sensors at the moment in the market. Hopefully that answers that one. I mean, a lot of that's uh, very specific stuff. So hopefully that's uh, that sort of job there, Ben. Um, when will new payloads become available or how to add third party sensors to enable uh, mapping? So I imagine there Julian's focusing on the fact that so the X5S and the X7 cameras from the 200 series aren't compatible with the 300 series. Um, Eduardo, do you know if there's any any plans for anything uh, from DJI uh, around uh, mapping sensors? Yes, yes. So what I can say at the moment um, concerning uh, mapping sensors or surveying sensors is that we're working on it to make sure that we enable the Matrix 300 RTK platform as a mapping platform. But at the moment, it is not possible because as Sam has just briefly mentioned, the 300 RTK is not compatible with X4S, which by the way is end of life, it's been end of life for months. It is not compatible with the X7, uh, no matter which lens. Uh, you connect, and it's not compatible with the X5S, which is not a mapping payload, but just to make sure that we are on the same page, it's not compatible again with X4, X5, or X7. We're working with third-party manufacturers uh, to make sure, again, that the 300 RTK will be a mapping-ready platform, but not at the moment. When? Hopefully soon. Hopefully sooner than later, but I can't give a specific timeline for that. So it's a yeah, it's a it's a watch this space, isn't it, for that one? Um, I think that's yeah. what we what we expected when we saw the launch. We we knew that DJI weren't going to leave that as such a big market. They weren't just going to leave that as a sorry, no, the drone can't the drone can't do this. So we're yeah. all, uh, waiting. For that. Also, also, also important to mention is that uh, in the Chinese market, for example, we've oh. seen already um, some manufacturers developing third party payloads third-party mapping payloads for the 300 um, and even the 200. But those Chinese manufacturers don't have the license to to sell their products overseas. So at the moment, it's a bit of a tricky situation. Gotcha. Cool. OK. Um, what else have we got down here? So can the M300 be purchased without the built-in RTK antenna? Um, so it can obviously be purchased without the, the base station. Um, in terms of the RTK antenna, I believe they're, they're just built in a standard, aren't they, uh, Eduardo? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So for the Matrix 300, there is only one model, and it is the RTK model. So uh, unlike for 
unlike the M200 series where we had 200, 210, 210 RTK, in the M300 there is only one option, which is with the built-in RTK antennas. Yeah, so you can use it without the you can use it without the base station, obviously, um, but the antennas are built in. Um, okay, um, so the IP rating. How about flying in snow, freezing rain? wanting to fly high altitude over Greenland in clouds, which will be sub-zero. Um, so, I mean, based on the, the specs, you can go, uh, I believe it's minus, minus 10 to plus 50. So you can go pretty pretty cold. The batteries are obviously intelligent and self-heating. Um, obviously, we as COPTAS haven't done any testing in those conditions. I'm not sure, Eduardo, if there's anything DJI have done uh, in, in sort of freezing conditions to test it to its limits. Um... In terms of operating temperature, I believe you say minus 10, right, Sam? Yeah. It, it is actually minus 20. So there oh, shouldn't yeah. be any problem flying in sub-zero conditions. Um, but when it comes to snow or rain, we need to refer to the IP45 rating and making sure not only that we're flying uh, respecting these conditions, these IP45 conditions, but that we are also performing a proper uh maintenance after the operations because sometimes the, it's not properly um the machine is not properly dried out and it's stored with some moisture and that moisture stays in the box it stays within the drone and then that can lead to several problems so three important three i would say that there are three important topics here when operating in such conditions first it is okay to fly in uh, uh minus and temperature sub-zero it is okay to fly within the IP45 uh, standard, but it's also really important to perform a proper maintenance. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's something that's uh, just universally true, is that the, the worse conditions you're flying in, the, the more stringent you have to be with your safety measures and with how you're, you're handling the equipment. Um, cool, okay, um, just moving on to, so we've had another couple of questions on the um, sort of the, the mapping, system uh, the mapping cameras and that kind of stuff so i think we've covered that one um but obviously if you want more specifics please let us know um does the m300 give the pilot an indication of wind speed and direction the uas is experiencing uh yeah so that would be part of the uh pfd and the navigation display um so yeah you, you get all that data as well um so uh, what else have we got down here? From the new design, having the internals above the rotors, does this make the UAS less stable or limit the weight that can be put on the upward facing gimbal? Um, it's probably one, one for you, Eduardo, again. Yeah, yeah, I can take that one. So um, first, it will not make the drone less stable, all right? Um, second, it will in terms of limiting the weight, um, the weight limit per uh, gimbal connection is 900 grams. And that doesn't really matter if it's uh, downward or upward, all right? And also to complement my answer, the way with, um, one of the reasons why we decided to, um, to, to have that rotors design, so kind of flipping over, is to make sure that uh, all the sensors, so both, visual sensors and TF, TOF sensors can properly uh, read the environment. And not only the sensors, but also an, uh, there will be an upcoming uh, radar that um, would be possible to install on top of the drone. So where the upward facing gimbal should be installed, we could put that radar to create the 360 um, surrounding awareness. And one of the reasons why, again, we have the rotors down is to make sure that that radar can properly read the environment. Um, see what else we can we can pick out here. We still got about fifteen minutes, so should be able to get through quite a few. Um, can the M three hundred be used with third party automation software? Um, so I imagine if you're talking about stuff like um, I don't know, like Pix four D Mapper, for example. Um, then I imagine the answer is yes, because it's the, still the DJI Pilot and, and all the same software, unless that's uh, anything's changed with that, Eduardo? No, no, nothing changed. Same. I mean, as long as the customer has the APK 
uh, the application can be installed in the smart controller. Awesome, cool. Um, I think that's answered a couple of questions on, on that as well. Um, is ADSB transmit? Some of our applications require it. Now, I don't believe it is transmit, is that right? No, just receiver. Just receive, yeah. Cool, no problem. Uh, going a bit quick fire here, get through a few of them. Um, <laughs> Has it got capacity for transponders recommended for BV loss? Uh, Is that one you can answer, Eduardo? ADSB transponders, I yeah. imagine, right? So, no. Um, whatever transponder wants to be uh, installed on the M300 needs to be installed externally. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there is no integration at all with, uh, with the platform itself. Yeah. Okay. Um, the three prop system, does it fly itself down or do you still have control and need to get it down manually? And someone asking for a video of the free prop landing as well. I've got a, a video of that that I can share, which I think we got from, from DJI. So mm -hmm. that's no problem. We can share that. Um, so Ben, I'll uh, make a note just to ping that to you uh, after this. In terms of the system um, flying itself down, um, from what I've seen, uh, although we've not tested it ourselves, it looks like it's just kind of limited control. Is that the best way to describe it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it kind of flies itself down slowly. So the pilot has a bi-directional, bi-dimensional control. The pilot, while the drone is going down automatically, slowly again, a uh, pilot will be able to, to fly uh, forward, backward, sideways to make sure that the drone um, lands in a, uh, in, in a safe spot yeah yeah i think the, the, the thing to remember with this is it's a it's it's a safety feature that's designed to if there is if the worst happens you can land the drone safely without damage anything it's not that if the worst happens you can continue to to operate that's not what it's built for it's to get the drone down make sure you don't damage anything make sure you land somewhere that's that's safe to land um i think we've answered that one on the smart controller um already is there the ability to integrate third-party payloads or gimbals, uh, Eduardo? Uh, yeah, I mean, payload is the game. Again, that's yeah. pretty much the, the answer I already gave and the, one of the first questions. Yeah, and, and there are already quite a quite a big range of third-party payloads um, out there. I mean, some of them like the, the Spotlight, the Wings on Z15 Spotlight, are being used pretty prolifically in the UK already uh, and worldwide. So... You can you can develop your own with the the SDKs, and there are ones out there that are being used by you know in a in a huge range of industries. Um, will DJI support modifications necessary for BV loss flight, such as I don't even know what that means, David Stone, electronic conspicuity? Um, can't tell you. I mean, English isn't Eduardo's first language, I don't believe. Uh, it is my first language, and I still couldn't uh, <laughs> yeah. that one. Uh, I don't know if that's something you can you can answer, Eduardo. No, no, not really. I mean, I don't really get the question, but um, I think I, I think the, the the question is what support would DJI give to uh, allow for modifications that allow for BV loss, and I would imagine that it's not something DJI would would kind of focus there. No, no not at the moment. But again, yeah. let's keep in mind that the moment you fly in farther the 400, 500 meters, you're already in beyond line of sight. So, yeah, exactly. It's a, it, it, it's more a case of there are stuff you can there's stuff you can do yourself. Um, but in terms of the stuff DJI have on the system, the ADSB is just to, just to receive information. It's not to transpond, and that's not the the main aim of the of the system. Um, so could you give a prox costs for commercial versus entry level packages? Um, in terms of approximate costs, um, we can't give anything too specific, but safe to say even your sort of higher level packages, you're not gonna spend more than say 20,000 pounds as a package with everything you need. Um, you could probably around half that for the, um, the more entry level packages. So that gives you a ballpark and tells you that it's, you know, it's not, we're not jumping up massively from the 200 series. We're actually around the same cost. Um, you have mentioned a radiometric thermal camera and standard RGB, but what spectral bands does it have for agriculture? Um, so the H20 series isn't really built for that market. So what you would look at there is some of the third party payloads, I guess from companies like uh, Microsense, uh, the Red Edge K1 
camera, the Parrot Sequoia, stuff like that. So payloads that aren't specifically DJI, but do fit onto, and I believe, Eduardo, would they be compatible with the M300 series? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So by a firmware update, they will be, they will be compatible, same as uh, with the same functionalities that they actually uh, have at the moment for the M210 V2. Yeah, perfect. So we'll, uh, again, something we're happy to discuss. It wouldn't be any of the payloads we've, we've sort of ran through today, but if you want to have a chat through the, the best option, happy to happy to do that. Uh, same, similar question there from Lauren. Does it support the Microsense multispectral sensors? So yeah, we're, we're on the way with that one. Um, what is the temperature range of the sensor in the H20T? Um, Eduardo, is that one you can answer? Yes, yeah, I can answer that one. So uh, it depends on um, on the feature called send range that it basically ranges from minus 40 to uh, 550 degrees Celsius. So it's, it, it, do you know if that's the exact same as the X-T2 or is it? Yeah, it is yeah. exactly the same one. Yeah. Um, okay. Is it possible to operate the M300 RTK in NFZ, I'm assuming no, no fly zones, as per military oper operations are concerned? How does the multi pilot mode work? So, we've got a few questions here, sort of in one. So, firstly, is it possible to operate in no fly zones? It, it's going to depend on specific circumstances. The, the drone itself doesn't really have an effect on the answer to that question, uh, if that makes sense. If you've got a specific application in mind, you work with the military or you work with public safety, or you're just doing work on a, for example, a military base, get in touch. The stuff that DJI can can do to support in terms of those kind of operations and stuff that we'd, we'd run through specifically. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's nothing specific from the M300 that would that would allow for that compared to any other any other drone in the market. Um, in terms of the maximum distance one pilot can be away from the other while flying the same drone, I imagine that would just be the middle point in terms of the range, the operating range of the drone. Um, if that makes mm. sense, Eduardo, is that, would that no, make not, sense? Actually, not really. So let's say that because of the whatever conditions the, the aircraft is flying in, the for example, the maximum transmission range is three kilometers, all right? So pilot A, will be in position A, the drone will be three kilometers from the pilot A, and pilot B will be another three kilometers far from the drone. So in that in that specific example, in that specific case, the, the distance between pilots will be six kilometers. Is it unlimited in the sort of amount of links you can have effectively? Up to two. Two, can you, yeah. is there a way to, um, I guess, extend extend that distance at all? Uh, in terms of distance or in terms of people connected to the drone? People connected, I think, is, is, is more uh, In terms of remote controllers, only two as a maximum. Uh, so for these type of operations, what's important to, to make sure uh, that's perform is both remote controllers are paired to the drone beforehand. Uh, they don't need to be connected to the drone when taking off. So that's why pilot A can take off, fly those three kilometers, and then uh, pilot B, which will be uh, who will be located six kilometers far from pilot A, will be able to see the drone and take over. And that's something that re that's really really interesting. When, for example, we are inspecting power lines, mm -hmm. because the pilot two can continue the the flight operations. But again, only uh, only only with a maximum of two uh, remote controllers connected to the drone. Awesome, and yeah, All exactly. paired. It, or to the drone. Yeah, it's the, it, the the two applications are going to be inspecting stuff. Yeah, like uh, like pipelines or, or power lines, uh, and then obviously there's this the stuff in sort of search and rescue and those applications as well. With that mm -hmm. going pretty yeah. cool. um, if I want to do search and rescue at night, which camera should I use? Um, I imagine the H20T would be the best option uh, for that. And as you mentioned, there are spotlight attachments uh, available as well. So um, if it's just night searching there's there's certainly some interesting combinations you can do but also stuff like the h20t can be used for this this massive range of applications as well um will the m300 be compatible with single or dual beam echo sounder connected to the drone by wire for shallow water seabed mapping um 
I think the easiest way to answer this is to kind of refer back to the stuff we've mentioned on the third party payload. Um, I'm sure that's something that's probably too specific for DJI to, to, to consider bringing out their own payload for it. But that being said, there's plenty of people out there that work on payloads for very specific and very niche operations. Um, so it'd be a case of someone developing that payload using the third party SDKs. Um, I think we're just about there in terms of questions. Um, Ben's had a couple of questions on sort of the, the, the wind speed. So if the M300 is hovering at a fixed point, can it therefore withstand 23 meters per second wind? So I think what Ben's getting at there, um, Eduardo, is because it can fly at a certain speed, but its wind resistance mm -hmm. given is lower than the speed it can fly at. So sure, yeah. it would be the same. I don't know if you can... You can so uh, this, the, the wind resistance, uh, and the reason why is 15 meters per second is to make sure that the drone can be operated. So the drone can take off, the drone can land, and the drone can fly with winds up to 15 meters per second of speed. Um, answering your question, if the drone is hovering at a fixed point, if it can withstand those 23 meters per second, uh, technically speaking, I would say yes, because that's part of the specs. Uh, I would then recommend it because you may not be able to, to land it because by landing, the propellers will have to, to reduce their, uh, their speed and that's when the drone may flip. So in terms of proper operation, when it comes to wind resistance 15, but the drone will be able to fly up to 23 meters per second in ideal conditions with not wind and, and and so on. Yeah, I think that's just telling us that there's, there's a difference, isn't there, between the the technical limitations of, of a piece of equipment like this and sort of real world what it can do. And that's why you're going to get sort of two, uh, two separate figures there effectively. Um, I'm just going to hammer through. There was a few questions dropped into the chat before we sort of got onto these questions. So we've got three minutes. So I'm just going to fly through a couple of these. Um, does the ultimate package include the charging station? Yes, it does. Uh, can the drone and controller batteries go in cabin luggage on commercial flights? Um, someone's kindly answered that for you there. No, the, the batteries are, are too high uh, capacity to be taken on commercial flights, but there is ways to, to ship them, etc. cetera. Um, the H20, is it 20 megapixels? Uh, or 20 MP. I think you're just asking for clarification there. Yes, it's the visual camera is 20 megapixels. Um, the T within it is for the thermal. So the H20 has no thermal. H20T does have thermal. Um, 20 or 12 megapixels was the question there. So the wide angle sensor in the camera is 12 megapixels, and the sort of standard camera with the zoom feature is 20 megapixels. And I think that is all the questions. Um, we've just had one more come in on, uh, will the M300 be CE marked to meet future EASA regulations? Um, Eduardo, can you give your thoughts on that one? Yes, I can give a quick answer to that one. So we are currently, uh, well, first topic, the technical standards um, coming from the European Commission or even the EASA, EASA organization are not clearly defined yet. So we don't really know how it will look like if we want to, to, to make sure that any drone and not only the M300 will have the CE marking. But what we're looking at is uh, making sure that our drones will be. Uh, the process to make sure that the drones will be CE marked, even though they're already in the market and even though they're already sold, that's uh, fully TBD. But the quick answer to your question, Matthews, is yes, we're looking at it, but we cannot confirm at the moment because there are quite some discussions going on. Awesome. Okay. I think that is every question. I'll just double check if there's been any more um, put in there. Uh, there's another one about the TB55 batteries, if they can be used. Uh, yeah, the answer is no TB55 and no TB50s, only 60s. Yep, yeah. uh, and then while tracking your target, does its live GPS location display on the pilot screen? Um, Eduardo? Uh, well, while tracking a target, the GPS location of the target displays, yes. So both, uh, there will be, uh, on FlyHub, there will be both GPS locations displayed. 
both the drone GPS location and the target GPS location. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I think that is all the questions answered and we're, we're bang on time. Um, thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, and thank you for all your questions. As you can see, you've got our, our contact info there. I'm sure uh, we will send out a follow-up email to this with my contact info for further questions, for pricing, et cetera, if there's stuff you need from, from us. Uh, Eduardo's email is there as well. So if you want to get in touch with him directly for maybe more technical-based uh, questions and inquiries, um, then his details are there as well. Um, but, yeah, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, Eduardo, any, any closing words? No, not at all. Thank you, everyone, again. Um, really good questions and happy to, to help you out if there is any other. Brilliant. Well, yeah, thanks for joining us, Eduardo, and thank you, everyone else, for tuning in. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time.